Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data webinar series with host Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will discuss emerging data management options. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag smart data. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our series speaker, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, Wiley, in 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in psychology and MS in computer science from SUNY Binghamton and his PhD in computer science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give, turn it over to Adrian to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, as always. And thanks to everybody who's uh, taken the time out of their busy schedules to join us. I know uh, I've been very gratified and uh, humbled by the international audience that we've been getting for this, so it's pretty cool. Um, I should just say one thing about the recovering academic part, because uh, I, I acknowledge that. I used to be a genuine professorial type, and usually when I'm preparing these webinars, that doesn't come out. I have to be careful today uh, when we're getting into graph databases, and I've tried to stay away from anything that's uh, too theoretical. Uh, but if we get into the weeds it, at any point, just pull me back a little bit, okay? Because uh, uh, I think this is an area where if you do have a strong background in computer science, you hopefully will want to go into more detail than I will today, uh, but we can just consider this the beginning of a dialogue. So we'll try and keep it at a, uh, a business and technology level today. Okay, with that, I'm going to start as soon as I can figure it. There we go. You know, it's always good to give some basic life advice. Um, and since I don't have a reality TV show as a platform, I'm gonna start here. One of the things that uh, we get into a lot when we're dealing with data management is the idea of modeling. And in particular, what do you model and how do you model it and how do you represent things? And of course, that's important in today's topic, looking at data management and specifically uh, we're going to spend most of the time uh, looking at graphs. So one of my uh, my long-term um, idols, I guess, uh, is Louis Sullivan, who is uh, uh, often credited as the father of the skyscraper. He was a Chicago um, architect who was Frank Lloyd Wright's boss for a while. And he's the one that uh, first wrote about form-following function. And I think that as we get into it today, you'll see that one of the real advantages of graph databases and graph notation, just using graphs, even if you don't use a graph database, but using a graph to model the world is a lot of the world as we see it, um, we can naturally think of in graph terms. But I do caution, uh, Don Gauze and Jerry Weinberg wrote an excellent book a few years ago on exploring requirements. And they pointed out that in military training, a lot of times you're taught that when the map and the terrain disagree, you should believe the terrain. So we're gonna look at how to get good models uh, to some extent and when it's appropriate, hopefully, to, uh, to use a graph database and when it's appropriate to put that in the mix with other things. There we go. So in that vein, in that, um, that line of thought, when you're thinking about a domain, something that you're, you're working on, the domain could be you know, your, uh, your vertical industry that has its own language. Uh, if you're in manufacturing, you'll be looking at things differently than if you're in medicine. And even within medicine, uh, you'll be looking at perhaps the same data differently if you're a provider than if you're a prescriber. So, I'm sorry, if you're a you know, 
if you're the payer, the patient, or the provider, you'll have different uh, views. So how you think about the domain is going to influence your choice of maps and models and rules and representations. And in particular, when we're starting to look at databases, uh, what are the required operations? What do you want to be able to do with this data? That's going to be important. So Marvin Minsky was one of the, uh, the early um, luminaries in artificial, artificial intelligence uh, tackled this problem back in the 1950s, I think this quote was from, that to solve really hard problems, we'll have to use different representations because each one has its own virtues and deficiencies, and none is going to be adequate for everything. So if it looks like I'm uh, on the warpath to get everybody to adopt uh, graph databases, uh, that's just because it's the, the, the topic today, understand that in most organizations, this will be yet another tool, another representation that will augment but not replace everything that you're doing right now. Adrian, I do have a yep. request for you to speak a little sure. bit. Sure. I'm sorry. Having a, a volume fair. problem today? How's that? Yeah, sorry. All yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, when we switched uh, configurations here, I can't actually see the meter to, to see the volume, but thank you for that. Okay, shall I start? No, I won't start again. Um, okay, so here's my, um, my view of the world of modeling which is going to be very important today. That's why I decided not to, uh, not to use PowerPoint or Keynote for it. And the issue here is we need to be looking at um, you know, the, the intersection of what you're modeling and the real world and focusing on that. Uh, it's not a, um, not a talk today on how to model, uh, so we won't go into, um, into that. I know there's a, a good data diversity uh, webinar on modeling and graph databases that uh, Karen Lopez did recently. So if you're interested in that, uh, that topic, you might look it up. I'm sure Shannon can tell you how to find, uh, find the slides for that one. But we have to understand that uh, if we don't get this part of it right, it doesn't matter um, how much you optimize things. So we'll start with that. And let's get right into uh, who needs a graph database or do you need one? And these are the kind of questions that we hope to be able to help you address by the end of the talk today. Uh, they're typical for looking at any new technology, but specifically for data management, what do you need to store or what do you want to store? How much is it um, looking at the volume of data? How complex is it and how fast is it moving? We did a session um, a month or two ago on uh, streaming data and analytics for streaming data. In general, what we're looking at right now is not going to be something that you would use for streaming data, uh, but it certainly can scale up for great volumes and really uh, complex structures. So, and then the third question, what do you uh, need to do with what you store? And that goes back to the earlier comment about defining the operations. You know, is it something where uh, you're looking at data that's going to be written once and retrieved rarely, or is it something that uh, that we have defined operations? Because your choices uh, range from the mundane, you know, files, tables, trees. Uh, and I didn't go into um, detail. I don't have slides on all these, because I'm assuming that uh, these sorts of terms, whether I'm using something that's a tree or whether it's a, a queue, you know, it's a list, a queue is... Um, like you're lining up in the movies to the bank teller, first in, first out, that sort of stuff. So we have a lot of traditional data structures, but then if you have um, uh, more needs for operations, you get into database management systems. Uh, you know, the traditional hierarchical relational, um, the relational uh, world has certainly uh, prospered over the last several decades and seems to be the default for a lot of things because um, of the rigor with which you can query the database, frankly. Uh, object databases uh, came into vogue in the 90s. There are some still around, and we'll look at uh, an example of one that's, that now has a, um, a graph-oriented view into an object database. And of course, uh, NoSQL and actual graph databases. So this is what we're gonna get into today. <clears throat> 
The diagram you see now, uh, this happens to be in the domain of um, cognitive computing, uh, where we've got machine learning at the center. But you could put almost anything in the center, uh, the application that you're working on, and start to partition the types of data that you're going to have to process. And uh, graph databases are um, rapidly being adopted for knowledge management systems, for the underlying architecture for um, for cognitive computing. And that's why I thought this would be an appropriate um, uh, way of looking at it. So we've got the input types, we've got the response types. Again, that's all data. And we could start to break that out into uh, how structured is it, what's the level of um, depth, if you will, for the structure, and I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. But basically, we need to start looking before we can answer the question about um, what's a good database and categorize and organize the data. And that's going to give you a cue into how you're thinking about things. I think that's that's really kind of the key. If you start to um, describe your data to someone and you recognize that you're doing it in this fashion, and we'll have a little graph 101 in a second, then it's probably a good idea to look at it. There are some data categories that we can get into that are probably not, um, you're not going to get any benefit out of it. Let's get in and actually look at sort of graphs 101, just so we have some common terminology. So a graph, simply, spoke, simply put, is a structure that has vertices and edges. Right? So the circles, the blue circles are the vertices. The lines are the edges, and you can use this to represent lots and lots of stuff. And I'll give you some examples, but in terms of the formalisms, this is where it starts. Now, uh, you can label each of those. Uh, you know, so in a particular domain, perhaps um, the vertices represent uh, places and the um, sorry, the edges represent um, roads highways, uh, paths, alleys, etc. going between them. That's one way of doing it. The vertices could be uh, airports, and the lines would be routes. It could be uh, people, and the lines between them are lineage or um, inheritance or familial relationships. Uh, this part of it should probably be pretty comfortable uh, just because we use graphs in, uh, in everyday life. But let's get into a little more detail here and see what it means when we're starting to represent this more formally so that we can use it in a database. And I, I want to make sure that I emphasize this. We're going to be looking at graphs and how to represent things as graphs and how to use perhaps um, graph databases. But you don't need to use a graph database to store a graph in a database. I want to make that distinction very clear. A lot of what we're doing here you can actually accomplish in a relational database, as an example. It may be more difficult, there may be more steps, but there's nothing conceptual here that says you have to have that database. So I'm not, uh, uh, not pushing that idea. It's just going to make it easier. So in this uh, case, we've got um, the graph and the edges are labeled, uh, the nodes are labeled, the actual name of a um, of an edge or a vertex, a vertex, um, the vertices, uh, the name itself is a property. So in this case, I've just listed. Um, we have how many things? There are five um, nodes and one, two, three, four, five edges. They happen to be directed. A graph doesn't have to have uh, a direction for the edges. So this is showing that you can get from A to B because there is that line and there's no line back from B to A or from anywhere else to A. So basically uh, on this, if you start at A or C, you can get somewhere. And if you don't, you can't. On the right-hand side, I have listed the names for uh, some of these and associated with each or an attribute or a property, so they can be represented as these key value pairs. And that's when we start to look at um, the idea of a, a property graph. It's how do you represent all the information that's on that graph based on its properties. So you'll see that uh, Old Post Road, for example, has two entries. It would have two entries in the database. 
one to tell tell you that it's a paved road and one to tell you the length. You can have uh, these properties, you define the properties basically when you're defining the, the data model. So it could be uh, age, it could be uh, average temperature, it could be the materials used. It's whatever makes sense in the context of what you're modeling. That's what you're gonna capture. Um, obviously, if you're gonna be doing um, operations on this, there has to be some common theme for the properties. Uh, you wouldn't uh, typically have a, uh, a graph where some nodes were people and some nodes were buildings and they didn't share any operations. Um, that's a whole different kind of thing. I will actually share one example where you can have um, nodes that are very different in terms of what they represent and still have a meaningful graph. So here we've got uh, the properties in this uh, key value system. Okay. Now, I just point out uh, here that when we're dealing with uh, data in general, and in particular when we're getting into kind of the smart data arena and we're looking at things like machine learning, a lot of times people talk about unstructured data and the requirement that systems be able to process unstructured data. Uh, for those of you that have been with us before on uh, numerous occasions, um, I said, I don't think there really is anything that's unstructured. It's a question of whether or not you know the structure and how difficult it is to determine the structure. The reason I'm using the chart today is because if we're dealing with a um, database that's organized around the properties of um, a graph, it's important that what's captured in the vertices and the edges uh, is actually something where the, um, the level of complexity, if you will, the level of structure is fairly high. And we may have to come back to that if there are questions, but uh, just kind of keep it in mind that if you have, um, let's say a blob in the database and it represents um, a video, you know, I'm shooting a lot of video these days and uh, things that I, I uh, save in files, I can end up with five gigabyte file for a minute of video. Uh, if you don't have the processing power there to determine the structure and define what's in it that's useful, you would think of that as being um, sort of a, a deep structure, and it's not probably something that you're going to want to uh, deal with in the, um, in the graph. But on the bright side, I'm going to assume that you're probably already thinking in graphs, even if you're not doing so explicitly. So uh, the four examples here. Uh, you're probably thinking graphs if you ever took a biology class, if you ever watch a detective show, if you care about uh, trivia in entertainment, or if you um, know any trivia in entertainment, or if you have occasion to remember or value or use uh, or process, if you will, relationships between people. So hopefully that includes everybody on the call, if not everybody that you know. So we'll start out with uh, thinking in graphs. If you took a biology class or played the game 20 questions, you're trying to determine something and you get to ask 20 questions. Generally, the first one is, is it animal, mineral, or vegetable? And that goes back to a um, couple hundred years in terms of uh, classification of the natural world into a taxonomy, which in fact can be represented as a graph. So the reason you do this is because that is one of the questions that will prune away as much of the world as possible in one question and let you move on. The next one, uh, I don't know how many of you watch detective shows, but there's usually a scene in it like the one on the left with uh, what's known as the crazy wall whiteboard. This one happens to be from the show Fargo where we put up the suspects um, and then start to draw lines and find, figure out what the relationships are. So you might be thinking of this as, well, that's kind of like an entity relationship diagram. And in fact, it is. You, you've got um, entities, you've got these nodes, if you will, the people are the nodes here. And the edges or the vertices are the relationships. And you can see that on this, this one, they're, uh, they're all labeled and that label represents something that will be a property in a property graph. I know it's just about impossible to read the one on the right. Uh, this is actually a real screen 
from a system. Uh, IBM actually acquired i2, and their system Coplink has been used in some pretty sophisticated um, criminal monitoring and fugitive apprehension cases. And what you have here is uh, people that are being tracked and attributes that they know about them. They're all classified. Um, and I don't mean classified as in secret. I mean, they're categorized and uh, similar attributes uh, are coded with uh, the same color, that type of thing. But basically what they're doing is building a graph of the people and the relationships. And you've probably heard about uh, things like social network monitoring and looking at uh, who knows whom in those sorts of um, networks. That's all done with uh, graph analysis, whether or not there's a graph database underneath. So <clears throat> next one. If you know trivia about movies, uh, I was happy to hear um, Karen Lopez the other day talking about the, you know, the Kevin Bacon game, because uh, looking at, uh, at at data and trying to figure out how many links there are, that goes back to Stanley Milgram's experiment um, on the magical number seven. Um, when you're starting to look at, um, I'm sorry, when you're, you're trying to determine how many degrees of separation there are between you and anyone else. And I think that as we get more connected the uh, social networks, obviously, the number of links goes down. In this case, uh, I just picked the IMDb database. Uh, David Sarzuk's an actor. Uh, you can go in and look at it. This is the kind of um, thing where you might look and say, well, I think I saw this guy in this thing, but I don't remember what who he was. So I can go in and I can look at the... Um, the entry, if you will, which would be a node for the show where you perhaps saw the person and then start to trace back. It's also a good example of what we call a multi-hop, where a typical query in this um, environment, you start with either a person or a um, an event or a, um, what do you call it, a, a, like a show or a movie, something like that, and then you can move back. You can go from one to the next and, and so on. And even if the database itself, as I said, is organized as, let's say, triples or relations um, for each of these graphs, that would make it harder to traverse, but you would still be able to do this sort of a multi-hop query. And uh, if you remember relationships between people, I had to do this because I never put uh, pictures of my kids. Those are my three sons. Uh, so, you know, if you think about um, the popularity of uh, folks going on and tracing their heritage, that's all done with graphs. Uh, family trees, for example, a tree is um, a particular instance of a graph. It's a type of graph. LinkedIn is uh, something that most people uh, on the call today probably use. This. Um, I won't say who, but I went on LinkedIn and I uh, selected somebody who I happen to know is on the call today. And these are the eight shared people that we know in common. Shannon, it's you. Um, so, you know, if you start to look at that and say, well, I'm interested in finding a connection to the person with a particular uh, role at a particular company and you have a tool like LinkedIn or like um, sort of a graph, even if there isn't uh, a LinkedIn, that's how we get that information. So the reason I'm going through this in, in this level of detail is so that you can start to think in terms of the types of queries, the types of searches, the types of uh, graph traversal, if you will, that you're going to want to have uh, because that that's going to help you understand how you organize things. And one last um, one on this. This is, uh, say, the anonymized look at my, my typical day if I'm doing uh, sales mode. And you've got nodes that represent companies that are already my clients. You have nodes that represent, in this case, the purple ones. These are companies that I want to sell to. And if I look at it and I say, well, how do I get um, to the right person at uh, bank zero, uh, 
I can look and say, all right, well, I know Jim, who uh, used to have Ellen work for him, and I can track through that. The way you organize the data, the way you think about the data, is going to help you create your model. And um, physically organizing it the way you logically think about it is what makes the difference between having something that is um, possible uh, with other types of data uh, organization or data management and something that is optimized for it. Okay. One more example. Um, we're going to look at uh, a couple of different ways to organize data. This one happens to be um, looking at a, uh, a cognitive computing system. And the reason I put it in here um, is because if you start to look at the different steps, um, presenting the results, getting the feedback, starting the, the statement, you can see that there are the, the processing here is what's going on at the edges. So you can have uh, something that looks like a, a project management graph, right? A project management chart, but you recognize that as you go from one state to the next, one um, state, state meaning a set of data points, so I'm looking for similar solved problems, the data has to be organized in that way before it can get to the next step. And so this is um, just a, a representation that shows that the processes themselves and the relationships between processes can be represented uh, in graph form. Uh, when you're looking at the types of um, the types of data and relationships that are a natural fit for um, for graphs, uh, taxonomies and ontologies, and I'll just say a word about each um, here, are things that are naturally represented uh, because they are typically hierarchical. There are relationships that uh, are generally inherited. And you can think of them as either trees or balanced trees. It, it doesn't really matter uh, in the abstract. If you're dealing with, with uh, a taxonomy here, um, you have the formal structure within your domain. And the, the critical part here is that if you identify any new node that you haven't seen before, it should fit within the classification scheme. You should know where it goes. So. Uh, if, in, in this case, um, motorcycle is defined to be a motorized vehicle with less than four wheels, all right, so it could be a unicycle, it could be a two-wheel motorcycle, it could be a, a three-wheel, then it's automatically going to go into one of these categories. Where you get into some issues is when something is um, ambiguous and in general, if we're describing something in natural language, there are ambiguities that need to be resolved, uh, and they will be resolved in the definition of the nodes or the properties of the nodes, if you will. So you know what properties are valid. So you can see here um, the weight. I don't actually have this. Okay, so I have motor vehicle weight is at the top because it's an attribute or a property of every type of vehicle. Uh, we could measure. But it may be that if this were um, a taxonomy that were being used by, let's say, uh, an insurance company, perhaps weight is irrelevant to them unless it's a commercial vehicle because that's how they, they rate it. So the same information, the same data, uh, can be structured differently based on the intended use. And that's important when you're starting to uh, create the design to see because if, if you've used any kind of a database, you probably recognize that there are lots of ways that you could represent this data. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a graph. But uh, if you think about it, if you're trying to describe data to someone before you put it in a database, uh, typically something like this, you sketch out the way I did on my desk uh, with all the post-it notes. And to me, what's interesting about a graph and a graph database is we have a lot of um, money being invested these days in tools to help you visualize data, particularly when you're getting into analytics. And basically, that's trying to create a way of looking at something that makes sense by the organization that you see or by the, uh, the, the symbols that come out of it. Graph databases, off the top of my head, are, are the one approach where 
uh, you, you can visualize before the data goes in. And so the visualization is almost bidirectional with the graph. All right? If you're writing out this information uh, in another format, you may have to, if you're constrained, let's say you have to do this model and you're going to put it in a relational database management system. Now you have to start to kind of flatten it out. You have to start to create relationships and tables and tuples and all that good stuff. Um, it's it's not a natural uh, transition. This goes back to my my form follows function uh, comment. If what you're looking at it is something that you think of in terms of a structure like a tree, then it makes much more sense to start to look at the um, a tree representation when it's being stored uh, mechanically. Okay. So that's the idea of a taxonomy. And taxonomies in general are a natural fit for, um, for uh, sorry, <laughs> for graph databases. And uh, I have talked about this. The, the little plug for the book on the side is just to say that uh, when I have that, uh, these are diagrams that actually come out of uh, the book that Judith and Marcia and I did on cognitive computing. Uh, the reason I, I like this uh, chart is that it shows that over time, the actual hierarchy will change. It doesn't mean that reality changed, but if you look here, this is the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM for the Psychiatric Association. And over the years, the same set of symptoms or properties, if you will, um, have been refactored and moved into uh, sort of a different view of the world. And that's a, a very important thing because we tend to think that uh, a fact is something that doesn't change. And I would say that in general, a fact doesn't change only if it is uh, so carefully specified that you have uh, temporal parameters, for example, and you can say this was true at at a particular time, so that would be another um, another parameter, another attribute uh, that needs to be captured. The other reason that I have it here is that to show that as these things change, as the uh, taxonomies evolve, the idea of a an ontology, which is the next slide, an ontology built on this would include everything that the taxonomy has. But it would also include more detail, the shared um, common understanding with the rules uh, as they as they um, as they're used within that community or that that domain. So if you look at here and you say, all right, well DSM going from DSM one to two to three to four, and up to the most recent one five, the common understanding changed, and so the way these things are interpreted and the rules that go along with them and why they're classified. That changes, and that would be part of the ontology, uh, and but not the taxonomy, which is a little simpler. Okay, so I wanted to have um, get this concept in without getting it too cluttered, because it's one thing to to think about um, graphs and start to look for graphs in daily life and say, well, this is how I would store it. This is just one example. Um, one of the reasons people like uh, relational databases, those who do, is that there is a set of math um, properties and principles that goes along with relations and how they fit together and uh, how you normalize and how you do your, um, your various operations. Graphs, if you're really dealing with a graph, there are mathematical properties that you can leverage. And I'm just going to give you one example here. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that if you have a graph like the one that we've been using and you represent it as a matrix, so in this case uh, we have five um, vertices from A through E, and uh, imagine that this is uh, completely filled out so where there aren't ones there would be zeros, but it's just a, a really difficult thing to look at on a, on a small computer screen. So the way you would interpret this matrix is that there is one path between uh, row A and column B. So there's one path that goes from A to B, 
if there were no arrow on um, on that edge on that on that um, path, uh, and it was bidirectional, then you would also have uh, a one in the matrix between B and A. But this shows you uh, because it's not symmetric that it's a uh, it's a directed graph. So this shows you all the paths of length one between any pair of um, vertices. Now the interesting property here is that if you multiply the matrix, and for those of you that have seen the movie The Matrix, you don't even want to think about uh, that, but if you multiply the matrix that represents the graph, you, represent, you raise it to a power, now let's say we're just going to go to the next slide and we square it, that matrix squared now gives you a one wherever there's a path of length two. So whatever the exponent is, an entry in that matrix represents the number of paths of that length. And I'll just take it one more, one more step, if I can here. So if you look, uh, this says that there are um, paths from B to B, okay? So we have one path from B to B of length three. It would go from B to D to E and back to B, uh, from E to E. All of these go through that little um, little cycle there, but it, there's no path um, from A to B that's exactly length three. And the reason this is important, two reasons I bring this up. One is that if you represent um, a world that you're modeling with a graph and you can re uh, put that graph representation into a matrix, there are a lot of things that you can do just by virtue of the fact that you have this knowledge of, of the basic properties. So if you want to find, uh, if this graph represents, let's say, um, uh, stops on your, um, on your UPS driver's route, and we have all the edges, we can add other things into the property, but this will give you um, the optimized route, assuming that uh, certain properties of the edges are the same. Now, the other reason that I bring this up is that the representation that we have here, this matrix, is obviously not a graph. It's a table. It's a matrix. Um, so we don't need to necessarily store uh, everything for every operation in the same form that it's going to be when we're representing the graph itself. If you uh, remember back to one of the early slides when I talked about the idea of a property graph. But this is kind of... Uh, a crucial thing if you're considering a graph uh, as your representation to look for the types of problem that you can optimize because it is a graph. Now, uh, I want to go quickly through um, where the market is now that we understand what it is we're trying to do. And I'm going to tell you flat out, the market's ready. There are options right now. There are commercial options. There are open source options. And emerging right now, um, are graph data management as a service options. So let's take a look. And I'm sure if you're looking on a small screen, this is uh, like an eye chart. So I'm just going to sort of summarize it. Uh, and whenever I, I pull a chart like this from Wikipedia, I have to, uh, uh, besides giving attribution, because it's always useful to have this, tell you that these charts are generally uh, incomplete. And I'll probably give you an example. but. Uh, what I wanted to do is to show that here's a list of um, database systems that are listed today as uh, being based on the graph model. Out of all of these, there are only a couple that are uh, commercially viable. We'll talk a little bit about that. But what they show is the name of the product uh, or the project, if it's an open source project that, uh, that isn't a commercial project or commercial product, what graph model they use, whether it's uh, RDF, the resource description, or whether it's a property graph, which is the one that uh, I mentioned. Um, but you can start to look at it and say, oh, okay, so what's the trend? What are people starting to use? Because you don't want to be in a situation where you're an early adopter, and you would still be a fairly early adopter if you do this today, where you get uh, stuck using something that's not going to last. And so, I've just highlighted the ones that use uh, a property graph model, uh, which is what I described earlier, or RDF, which is the resource description framework. It comes from the World Wide Web Consortium. 
Uh, originally, it was uh, developed as specs for metadata modeling, but now it's used uh, sometimes to describe uh, knowledge stores in a knowledge management environment. So that's pretty cool. Uh, where it has the API column, you'll see that a lot of these require, um, or at least give you access to the data using uh, Java or C++, uh, Python. What's also interesting is that uh, there's an emerging um, class of technologies or tools to help you access, to help you traverse these graphs. And so that's why I say, uh, if, if they don't, if you can't get to them through SQL, so that's no space SQL as opposed to a no SQL database, uh, it's no problem because there are these emerging languages. So Gremlin, uh, which I'll come back to in just a little bit more detail, is completely open source. It's a traversal language and it's supported by many of the companies and the projects that were on that chart. Uh, Cypher was developed by Neo4j. Uh, I had a talk with folks at Objectivity recently. Uh, they've been around for oh, probably nearly 30 years, Objectivity, as uh, an object-oriented database. And now they're providing a cipher-oriented um, layer, if you will, so that you can get to the data in an Objectivity database and view it or consider it to be uh, a graph database. Uh, Sparkle, uh, an open source approach based on, um, on the Sparkle protocol. It's a sort of recursive label for that. So now I just come back uh, and highlight Gremlin, Sparkle, um, that are the, the real, um, uh, those three, Gremlin, Sparkle, and Cypher, probably account for the majority of the emerging market. Uh, and anyone that doesn't have access uh, via one of those, you're going to be doing a little more uh, coding. So that's what, what the detail is in there. Okay. Um, I'm mindful that I need to wrap it up in a few minutes. Um, Apache, uh, again, if you've uh, heard any of um, the talks in this series, I always talk about the open source implications, and Apache is certainly sort of the leading um, organization, if you will, at the top that promotes these uh, projects and um, uh, development environments. So Apache Tinkerpop is a graph computing framework that is um, open source, and uh, it's tied to uh, Gremlin as the graph traversal language. Okay. Need to leave uh, some time for questions. So uh, in terms of who's using it today, uh, I will say that I took the, the easy way out on this. Um, because in terms of market penetration, market um, adoption, Neo4j is clearly market leader for uh, the standalone graph databases. And these are just some examples of companies that are uh, using uh, Neo4j as the database with uh, either Cypher uh, or one of the other approaches to actually get to the data, but on commercial systems. And so, you know, particularly if you're looking at something like eBay uh, doing service routing, uh, which is what I was talking about before in terms of looking at that direct graph or Walmart, um, recommendations based on the data being stored this way, it's really, uh, it, it's at the point now where it's, um, it's no longer uh, as much of an adventure, if you will, starting to adopt it. So getting started, what, what are the, the key things? Why would you choose the database? I think that the three keys here are uh, speed to delivery. If you can naturally model the data that you're looking at as a graph, uh, it simplifies these multi-hop queries. Think again of uh, looking at, say, the IMDb database. IMDb database. If you start with um, something that's a completely different category from what you're looking for, you're looking for the name of an actor, and what you have is uh, the name of a movie, or you know that somebody else was in it, you start to go through it. You're going in these multi-steps. That's really nicely modeled as a um, as a graph. And finally, visualization. I think it's baked in because if you think about um, the graph as the way the data looks before it goes in, then when you get the visualization tools, it's going to be very familiar. So the questions that you have to look at today, if you're going to be adopting it, are 
uh, first of all, are, are you looking for something where you have to have an on-premise solution or are you going to manage your own database even if it's uh, in the cloud? In that case, uh, there are lots of options from that chart. Uh, Neo4j is clearly the market leader. If you want to do something where it's um, managed for you as a service, uh, right now probably the the closest thing to you know a scalable, uh, large-scale uh, solution as a service is what IBM is offering through Bluemix. It's in beta now, but that'll be um, out there within a couple of weeks as a commercial product. So we're going to uh, close it out and uh, open up the questions. I put in a quick hat tip to Camille Nixon. Uh, Camille is actually, uh, we did a panel together at an event recently, and I had a good conversation with her last night to kind of test some of these ideas. So I just wanted to thank her for that. She was um, at Neo4j, now she's at IBM. Got a couple of upcoming webinars, and I'm sure Shannon will tell you if uh, you don't know about the July webinar, which is part of the uh, Smart Data Online Conference. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Shannon. Adrian, thank you so much for another great presentation. Um, that's certainly one of the most common questions we get are people asking about, inquiring about the slides. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email within two business days with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. Feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so there was a comment here, Adrian, that um, the presented motor vehicle taxonomy could, is possibly incorrect. Uh, for example, a commercial vehicle can be- Wouldn't surprise me. Sorry. It says the presented motor vehicle uh, vehicle taxonomy is possibly, for example, a commercial vehicle can be a passenger car. Mm. You know, that's, um, I appreciate the comment. And let me uh, explain how I almost got arrested for that uh, one day. I was driving through uh, a toll booth, for those of you that are familiar with the Henry Hudson Parkway in uh, New York, and it's for non-commercial vehicles. I was in a van uh, that was registered as a multi-purpose uh, vehicle in Connecticut, but in New York it was considered to be a, um, a commercial vehicle. And to me, uh, I should actually probably use a picture of that in, in here. I think the issue is that um, it depends on who's creating, who's creating it and for what purpose whether or not this would actually be correct or, or incorrect. And I, I appreciate the, um, the question, the clarification, or, or pointing it out if, uh, if it's universally an error. Uh, I think the issue is that for a taxonomy like that, it depends on who is, um, what it's being used for. So what's, what was interesting to me that day as, uh, as I was partially stopped from my forward progress was that <clears throat> law enforcement in two different jurisdictions on a road that if you were to, to graph this out, uh, go back to that example, there's a point A was uh, where I started in Manhattan, point B was uh, where I was hoping to get to in Connecticut. That's one road, but somewhere in the middle, the rules of the road changed. I'm not sure if that addresses the question or not, but I, I think the issue is it's really about context. So I appreciate uh, someone for bringing that up. And there was a question here about visualization schools, but before I get to that, um, let me just stay here on graph for a little bit. Um, do you find many um, folks converting relational to graph, and do you, can you mention a few use cases? Um, do I find them converting? You know, I, I would say not a lot uh, are, are going to go through the conversion process. I, I think it's mostly uh, right now um, new application uh, where it's a more natural modeling approach. Um, what was the second part of that, a, a use case? Yeah, do you have any uh, use case example? Well, I think if you look at um, sort of the areas that, that were shown in um, that NEO slide, a lot of it has to do with uh, transportation or logistics or movement from one point to another. Um, I, I guess uh, some of those certainly predate um, uh, the, the popularity of graph, formal graph databases, 
And so that would be more of the case that I, I talked about before, where you, you don't need a graph database to represent a graph. It's just a lot easier. Uh, and, and I guess the way I look at it is um, you could represent everything that we're doing here in another form, but why would you want to? So I, I think that we're just starting to see that uh, that shift. I don't have a lot of good use cases that I can comment on uh, where people have actually replaced an existing data store, done a transformation, if you will, from a relational representation to a graph representation. Um, but I will, I'll, I'll actually look into that, and if the, uh, the person that asked the question wants to shoot me an email, uh, I'd be happy to uh, see what I can share with them. Certainly. And, and uh, so talking to your uh, cognitive computing expert, do you find uh, many folks converting, or excuse me, uh, or where am I? I'm just, I just lost my place. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, cool. Well, I can't see any of the questions today, so <laughs> you, you can ask me anything, and I will uh, believe that somebody else actually asked it. <laughs> Are graph databases uh, the foundation for most cognitive computing platforms? For most. I would say um, no, but I would say that most... Um, you know, right now, cognitive is still in the early stages, and, and one of the issues is that um, the label cognitive is being applied to a broad area, you know, anything from uh, predictive analytics to to uh, machine learning. And uh, if you look at sort of that wide range, I would say that most of the systems that I'm familiar with that um, are fairly large scale will have uh, some graph attributes. Uh, they may use a graph database. I don't know of um, many that are using uh, graph at the core exclusively. It, it seems to be a mixed environment. And part of that is what you're actually trying to store. So if, if you go back to one of the, the slides where I talked about um, you know taxonomies and, and ontologies, you may have um, sort of a, a lot a large volume of data that's um, coming in that's historical. Uh, let's take oncology, for example. It's, that's a, a well-studied area with cognitive computing. And the, the data itself um, originates in a form that is not in a graph database. You know, it originates as text in journals or patient records or case files, and then it gets um, goes through some machine translation, we get into natural language processing, which um, actually I think is the, the topic we're going to cover next month. Um, so it, it may, um, it, it, in terms of preparation for query management, uh, many of them are now uh, putting that into a graph database, uh, but it's not the exclusive way that something is represented. Sort of a, a tiered approach. If you think about how uh, we generally handle storage, uh, storage management, that depending on uh, the usage and the complexity uh, and the speed with which something is, is needed, we may put it in um, at different levels or different tiers uh, and just bring it in as needed. So for, for the actual traversal, um, right now I, I think that's um, more likely where you're going to see it. Interesting. All right. Well, I accidentally marked this as, as as answers, so let me make sure I get to it. Any recommended visualization tools that can be talked about? For a lot about graph presentations. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I don't have uh, a resource on that because most of the tools that are um, uh, sold today as visualization tools, uh, and you know, there's a, a whole list of those. I can. If anybody's interested, I have a chart that I think I used in uh, an earlier presentation listing uh, data management and visualization tools. I'll be happy to, to send that to you if you want to um, circulate it because there's a few dozen. Um, but most of those are actually visualization tools uh, that are aimed at more conventional, I hate to say conventional, but uh, at, the, at the relational world. <laughs> 
I, typically, we're, we're at the stage now in terms of development where the visualization tools that you're going to see um, are are driven by the vendors themselves of the databases, and and just like it was with uh, visualization for relational databases, uh, you didn't see a lot of tools from third parties that would improve on what the vendors were doing until there was a large enough user base. So I don't think that today there's a, enough of a, a, a user demand for that. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, NoSQL, and uh, I, I did cover some of these um, last time, companies like uh, oh, Stream Analytics or Zoom Data, um, uh, that's where you'll you'll find uh, companies that are doing some very sophisticated stuff at extracting out, um, extracting, abstracting, and presenting in visualization tools. Uh, but those typically today are not uh, not aimed at the uh, graph graph market. I don't think it'll be long. Sure. Um. How do you see master data vendor solution existing solutions working or enriching the client information with graph solutions for uh, social data? It, it, for example, identity household. Any cases, examples already in production in that case? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I, I got the... <laughs> the mouthful for sure. Um, yeah. How do you see... Data um, vendor solutions working or enriching the client information with graph solutions um, for social data, for example, identity household. Any examples? Mm. Um, I don't have anything I can share today. Conceptually, what I can talk about is, uh, you know, one of one of the things that we're we're dealing with um, today in in general is that we're starting to find lots of large rich data sets that are becoming available from third parties uh, social data um, social networking data that sort of stuff uh, in general um, there are issues there in terms of privacy and security but uh, we are starting to see and I, I've used examples in the past couple of months uh, from Google and Yahoo providing these data sets. Uh, and, I, and I think that where we're getting to is that uh, that's going to actually tie in to uh, the previous question in terms of visualization and, and third-party tools as people try and uh, rationalize, if you will, data from different sources. Uh, because right now, if, if you go back to that uh, Wikipedia chart, uh, there are a couple of different approaches to how the data is actually stored. Um, you know, I talked about RDF and property graphs, et cetera. Uh, but even within there, if you're talking property graphs, uh, getting from one um, one vendor's database that claims to be managing uh, the data as property graphs to another that's also saying it's done as property graph, uh, that's still not something where there's a standard and a third party is going to come in and, and uh, be able to look at both of those. Uh, so I, I think that we're probably, I hate to put a time on it, um, but uh, I would say uh, things like the, the IBM system that I mentioned under Bluemix that's going to be out in general availability in a couple of weeks. Uh, once you start to get a lot of people using something like that, then I think the the third party tools will emerge. I mean, uh, on, a, on a separate but related issue, uh, uh, quantum computing, which is something we're going to talk about towards the end of the year, um, IBM just made available for free access to a five qubit quantum computer. And they had something like 30,000 people sign up in the first uh, 24 to 48 hours. So as we start to uh, get people to understand uh, why you would want to represent something in, in graph form, and as you have platforms, and IBM is just one of them, I mean, typically in this space, um, whenever something scales up like this, uh, you'll find IBM, sorry, IBM, uh, Amazon, and um, Microsoft will all end up with 
platforms like this that allow you to do it, uh, it's at that point that the, the ecosystems evolve and then you'll start to see those kinds of tools. Sure. And, uh, you know, we, we actually hosted a white paper for uh, Neo Technology for a bit written by Karen on MDM and graph databases. We oh, did you? Okay. Have it on the page anymore, but I'm sure you can find it on uh, Neo Technology's website. Um, Adrian, thank you so much. This has been another fantastic presentation. Just very, uh, just great presentation, great topic. Thanks to thank all you. of our attendees. Yeah, thanks, and thanks for, to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and, and, and offering up such great questions. And um, as you mentioned, we will be uh, meeting up again next month uh, to talk about, um, uh, well, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> sense and sense I think it's a... Perception to personality, yeah. It's either that or it's NLP. I, I have both of those on my list, and I don't... <laughs> One of those topics. It's it's a mystery topic. <laughs> you and I can talk offline, and then we'll get it straightened out. <laughs> yes, it'll be June 9th. Um, also, we have, um, as you mentioned, we have Smart Data Online happening June 13th, our first Smart Data Online conference. I'm very excited, and thank you for participating. And uh, we hope to see you all next month, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks. Thank you.